this morning I found this uh, quotation, which uh, was from uh, JFK. Let me go back. For the great enemy of the truth is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived, and dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. That uh, is a very relevant quotation to the situation that we have uh, with regard to nuclear power. Uh, renewable energies uh, have been heavily subsidized for the last two or three decades in the United States, and they now pro provide a measurable amount of our energy. But what the science tells us is that we've got to phase out the fossil fuel emissions over the next few decades. By the middle of the century, we need to be off of fossil fuels. And uh, you can get an indication from this uh, chart that uh, the renewables there's, are not going to take us there. And you, you need to look at the whole issue as Michael has, has just described. But that's just the United States. The situation in the developing world is even much more difficult. And China and India are becoming, China is now the biggest emitter, and, and India will surely pass the United States. Uh, and they're getting really a negligible amount of their energy from renewables, even though they've invested very heavily in them. Uh, and if we look at the history, Michael already mentioned the fact that the examples of where we've been able to install carbon-free energy rapidly, the fastest examples are all nuclear power. When a country like Sweden decided, okay, we, we need to phase out uh, carbon energy, they built 10 nuclear power plants in Sweden and a couple in Finland, but they did it in about a 10-year period and uh, completely decarbonized their electricity. That's what we have to do. And you have to compare the way they did it to what Germany is trying to do now and being so unsuccessful. Uh, and I'm not advocating any, I, I uh, you, you know, South Korea has demonstrated that they can build nuclear power plants and do it on time, on schedule, and on budget. Uh, they're, they're still light water reactors, the technology we've been using for 50 years. I think there are, we've known for decades, actually from the beginning of the nuclear age, that there are better ways to generate nuclear power, uh, which deal with many of the issues that have been raised about nuclear power. And this is an example of one of the kind of technologies which we should have ready right now, but our governments simply didn't do their job. They didn't support R&D over the last few decades. Uh, it's really a, a failure of our government, particularly in the United States. <laughs> These are two of my grandsons. I took this picture a few years ago. Connor was a uh, uh, big, big Indiana Jones fan, and he's the one who actually got me started wearing his hats. He gave me uh, an Indiana Jones hat for Christmas several years ago. But uh, he uh, it's, it was amazing. I can't remember how old he was. At about ten years, uh, ten years old, when he uh, made these observations, because there are two critical uh, facts which he correctly identified. Uh, he says that unless uh, young people, when they grow up, unless they can figure out how to make a time machine that actually works. There's going to be no way for them to fix the problem if we stay, if grown-ups stay on the path that they're on right now. Uh, and he also said uh, 
the other thing is, grown-ups are scared of nuclear power, but they shouldn't be scared of what will happen if they keep doing what they're doing. Because we know ways to make nuclear power safe. Actually, the past nuclear power has been very safe. More people die in one day from the air pollution from fossil fuels than have died in a 50-year history of nuclear power plants. So they've been, they were actually pretty safe. But we know how to do things much better for the future. We know that using fossil fuels is not safe. It is very dangerous. So it's amazing that a 10-year-old can understand what many of our government leaders cannot understand. Uh, one other, one other um, comment. <laughs> you know, I, I, I. Why do I speak out on this subject? It's, it's. Uh, it's very uh, impractical for me because it makes it extremely difficult for me to get funding for my organization. I have five people in my uh, group, Climate Science Awareness and Solutions, and I have to get them. I can't get any money from the government. I, they don't like me. <laughs> they never liked me even when I worked for the government. But uh, so I have to go to philanthropic sources and 80% of them are anti-nuclear because they're the people with money grew up in the 1970s. They, they, uh, so that's, but um, I, the reason is, I think of it, you know, if you think of Galileo, when he um, was told, you know, that uh, the, the earth is the center of the universe and the sun goes around the earth, and you better agree with that or else. He decided, well, yeah, I guess that's right. <laughs> because it was for, for, and there was no harm in him doing that because he knew the world would find out as the telescopes got bigger. It would prove that he was right, <laughs> that the earth goes around the sun. And it made his life, his life and his daughter's life much easier. But now, we can't do that. If, if we say, oh, well, yeah, eventually the real life examples are going to prove, if, if we are right that there's no way to, to phase off all fossil fuels within a few decades without the help of nuclear power, which I, I think is, is pretty clear. Uh, so we'll be proven right, but by then, then it's too late. <laughs> you know, so I have to say what I think is a very uh, clear scientific conclusion. Uh, that's all I'm going to say. Thank you. So, since uh, Michael has blazed through his very long slides, and um, I was amazed, but he's good. He did a TED talk, and there they cut you up at 18 minutes. Um, we do have time for a question, so I'll, I'll throw it out there. Gentleman in the front raised his hand first. Um, okay, let's get one at a time so we can measure the time. Okay. Hello, my name is Reinhard Urwig of Friends of the Earth Austria. Um, I disagree with you on a couple of issues, but the one thing that really would interest me is how you see, you, James Hansen, see the future of economics of nuclear power. Because if you look at feed-in tariffs, for example, in the UK at the moment, you know, the, the Hinkley Point project, they have been guaranteed 9.25 pence per kilowatt hour for 35 years index increased. They just had offshore wind auctions for 5.75 pence per kilowatt hour. So renewables are already cheaper today. And this power plant is not even being built. And there's quite a number of CEOs of nuclear power companies who criticize nuclear now on grounds of economy. So how can nuclear save the climate if it's way more expensive, basically? Yeah, that's a, a good question, which I'd like to address. Uh, and Michael might want to say something also. But, um, and, and I should uh, say that I'm not 
opposed to uh, renewable energy. We should not be taking any carbon-free energies off the table. My barn is covered with solar panels. I generate twice as much electricity as we use. So I haven't paid a utility bill in six or seven years since I put up the solar panels. In fact, the utility is paying me. But uh, the reason that solar is cheap is because of all the uh, development that's occurred with all these subsidies and the fact that in the United States we have these renewable portfolio standards. Utilities are told you've got to get X percent of your energy from renewables, whether you like it or not. And then the cost of that is passed on to the other, uh, the other people who are not uh, putting solar panels up on their, on their barn. But uh, you have to look at the total cost of the system, not just the solar panels. And then look at uh, Germany's electricity cost. Compare it to France. Uh, sure, the, you, you, we will need the next generation nuclear is going to have to be, support, the R&D is going to have to be supported. Once you have that, you choose a design and you start churning those out in factories, uh, it it will be it will be competitive with uh, coal, uh, I think. So I don't know. Do you want to say anything more on that? Sure, I'll add something. I mean, I think it's pretty rich for an organization that says that climate change is a potentially catastrophic threat to be sitting here then complaining about a slightly higher electricity price in Britain. I'm sorry if I don't believe you. Friends of the Earth was founded on a grant from an oil man. This is all very public record. It's always advocated fossil fuels over nuclear. The priority in attacking nuclear is because it was cheap and abundant electricity. And the focus in particular for Friends of the Earth was halting the expansion of cheap energy to poor countries. I mean, that's on your hands. In terms of the price of energy, Jim's right. You cherry pick the price of the electricity being generated by the wind turbine when it's generating electricity. When wind isn't subsidized, nobody builds it. Warren Buffett said, it's not worth doing without the subsidy. Again, don't take my word for it. Just see if those wind turbines get built without that subsidy. The, reason, the way you make nuclear cheap is you build the same kind of reactor over and over again like the Koreans did. Why didn't they do that in Britain? Because the anti-nuclear movement, including Friends of the Earth and Greenpeace, stopped them from doing it. So then you guys come around and say, well, why is it expensive? Because they have lost the experience building the plants thanks to the anti-nuclear movement. Now, I'm sorry I won't let you have a rebuttal, but you guys can do it out in the, the hall afterwards. Um, but I, I will, uh, no, I, there was a gentleman over here, the gentleman from Egypt. Do you still have a question? Because you asked a very good question before. Um, if you're from the same group, I'd like to get some, another I'm question. I'm not from the same group. I'm from It's a different answer. We only have one more question, time for one more question. So please make it short. No grandstanding. My name is Kerstin Rudek and I come from north of Germany from Bürgerinitiative Umweltschutz. Our organization is 40 years old and we are very experienced in nuclear waste because we are uh, in this topic for all these years and there is no place for high radioactive nuclear waste and we have a new law in Germany and what our experience is that nobody wants the waste and for good reason, because there is no security for it, to keep it 40,000 generations or one millions kept from the people, not harming it. We won't and have time what, to answer it. What keep do it. you think about storing high radioactive nuclear waste in Germany, in your countries worldwide? That would be really interesting. Thank you. It's very the, much. The, the waste from nuclear power is the. Yay! She repeated things that she already believed. The waste from nuclear power is the best kind of waste that's produced from energy. May I answer the question? May I answer the question or not? I mean, um, the waste from fossil fuels kills seven million people a year. The waste from solar panels goes to poor communities where they break it up and are exposed to heavy toxic metals. The selective concern for nuclear waste, which doesn't harm anybody, is simply bizarre. You're in the grip of a superstition. 
You're in the grip of a superstitious set of fears that have no basis in any mortality data. There's no peer review data that that waste hurts anybody. Again, we can't get into a dialogue on this. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We side with science. Excuse me. We have to close this press conference in a moment, and I would like to get out in an orderly fashion. Obviously, this is a very controversial subject. Please take it out.